I warmly welcome all of you to the second technical session of the 14th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. This session will be chaired by Dr. Ranga Pereira and Dr. Dumita Govindapala. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor of introducing the chairpersons of this session. Dr. Ranga Pereira is a senior lecturer of surgery at the General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University, as well as the clinical coordinator at General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. He is a consultant oncologist surgeon at the University Hospital, KDU. Dr. Dumita Govindapala is the head of the Department of Medicine and a senior lecturer in medicine at the clinical department at General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. She is a consultant physician at the University Hospital, KDU. Judging this session are Professor Saroj Jayasinghe, consultant physician, former chair, professor of medicine, Department of Clinical Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, and Professor Aindra Balasuriya, consultant, community physician, head and senior lecturer of public health and family medicine, General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. We are fortunate to have two eminent academics judging this session. Dr. Ranga Pereira and Dr. Dumita Govindapala, I now hand the session over to you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I warmly welcome you all to the second sleep paper session of the IRC KDU. And this session, during this session, there are six presentations and uh, the presenters will have 10 minutes for their presentation, followed by four minute discussion. Um, I kindly request you all to keep your microphone switched off and keep your mobile silent during this session. Uh, I will ask my co chair, Dr. Ramesh Pereira, to introduce the first presenter of, the session, of this session. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the first presentation we have today is investigative clinical data in their correlation Cassie and embryonic antigen levels in the cohort of patients with colorectal cancer. The present day is Mr. F.T. Munidi. You can start, uh, Munidi. A very good day to all present here today. I am Tasmin Mukhidri and I'll be presenting our research study on investigating the clinical, biochemical, and pathological data and their correlation with carcinoembryonic antigen levels in a cohort of patients with colorectal cancer. So this presentation will cover an overview of colorectal cancers and carcinoembryonic antigen, the objectives of our study, how our study was carried out, and then we will look into our findings and conclusions and finally future work. So to start with, colorectal cancers are cancers that arise in either the colon or victim, and they are often grouped together as they have many features in common. So it is a common type of heterogeneous disease that arises due to an accumulation of many genetic mutations. It is reported to be the third most frequent cancer type and fourth leading cause of all cancer-related deaths in Sri Lanka and globally. And then when we look into the prevalence of colorectal cancer, it is seen to be higher in Caucasian populations. However, since recent times, the burden is seen to be increasing in low and middle-income Asian countries as well. 
also there is an increase in incidence in the younger population. So the two graphs in this slide show the incidence and mortality rates of colorectal cancer from 2018 to 2020 globally and in Sri Lanka. So statistics show that the percentage increase of colorectal cancer incidence from 2018 to 2020 globally was by 5.56% and the global mortality rate of colorectal cancer was 4.44%. And then when we look into data reported in Sri Lanka, we see that there has been a surge in the morbidity and mortality rates of colorectal cancer from 2018 to 2020, where the percentage increase in colorectal cancer incidence was by 60.3% and the percentage increase in mortality was by 10.4%. So now moving on to carcinoembryonic antigen, which is the most widely used biomarker for colorectal cancer diagnosis. The CEA is a high molecular weight glycoprotein that was discovered in 1965 and is produced by the large intestinal cells. So the importance of CEA in colorectal cancer is that it helps in assessing the status of the tumor which then allows prediction of treatment response and disease outcome of the patient. So usually in healthy adults, CEA levels are very low. Therefore, concentrations higher than five nanograms per milliliter is indicative of colorectal cancer tumors. Further, when we look into the specificity and sensitivity of CEA, CEA is known to have a very high specificity. However, its sensitivity is low as almost 60% of patients do not express CEA. So as we saw in the previous slide, CEA has a very low diagnostic sensitivity. So this means that in some colorectal cancer tumors, the CEA levels are within their normal range. So therefore, the role of CEA in the diagnosis and predictive value of colorectal cancer is controversial. So currently worldwide, a lot of research is being done on different populations where CEA levels are being investigated and their correlation with other clinical findings are being identified. So in Sri Lanka, research done on colorectal cancers is very limited and so far none of the research has reported CEA levels or its correlation with clinical or biochemical findings. So therefore the objectives of our study were to analyze CEA levels in a cohort of Sri Lankan colorectal cancer patients and to investigate the correlation between CEA and tumor size degree of differentiation as well as biochemical parameters. So now looking into how our study was carried out, we recruited 48 colorectal cancer patients who were reported to the oncology unit at University Hospital KDU. So our exclusion criteria for patients with other cancers, HIV, chronic infections, immune diseases, as well as cardiovascular and cerebrovascular diseases. So once patients provided written informed consent, we then gathered their demographic and clinical data. So thereafter, we correlated patient CEA levels with tumor length degree of differentiation, as well as selected biochemical parameters such as hemoglobin, white blood cells, platelet, and alanine amino transferase levels. So all data were statistically analyzed and p-values less than 0.05 are considered statistically significant. Now looking into the results we obtained, starting off with demographic data. So an equal number of males and females were recruited into our study and the mean age of our subjects was 63 years, while three-eighths of them had family history of malignancy. So when we look into the clinical characteristics observed in our study, majority of the tumors were left-sided, meaning the tumors were mostly found in either the descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectosigmoid junction, rectum, or anorectum. And most of them were diagnosed at the moderately differentiated stage. Further, when we considered the length of the tumor, 
we found the average length to be 4.42 centimeters. So this average value of tumor size is consistent with previously reported findings where 4.5 centimeter has been reported to be the average tumor size. So now moving on to biochemical parameters, we identified that the average hemoglobin white blood cell platelet and alanine amino transferase levels of patients were within the normal reference range. However, when it came to CEA, CEA had a high value of 55.91 nanograms per milliliter. So this extremely high value highlighted the importance of assessing CEA in colorectal cancer diagnosis. And now looking into the correlation of clinical data with CEA. So from our results, we didn't identify a correlation between CEA levels and tumor size or degree of differentiation. Also, there was no significant correlation identified between CEA levels and the biochemical parameters that we focused on in our study, as all p-values were found to be greater than 0.05. So these results that we obtained are consistent with previously published research. So therefore, we conclude that majority of the colorectal cancers diagnosed in our study were at the moderately differentiated stage and had high CEA values. So when we look at previous literature, a few studies have shown high CEA levels in patients with well-differentiated stage of tumor compared to the poorly differentiated stage, while another view indicate that there's no correlation between CEA levels and the differentiated stage and size of the tumor. So the results of our study also indicate that there's no significant correlation between CEA and the selected clinical findings that we focused on, including tumor length and degree of differentiation. So therefore, the prognostic significance of CEA remains controversial, and our results also indicate that CEA alone cannot be used to predict disease severity. So therefore, future directions are important. So we are currently recruiting more samples into our study to validate these results obtained so far. And also we are working on identifying other potential markers, namely cytokines and correlating cytokine levels with CEA levels to assess the benefit and use of such alternative markers in the diagnosis and prognosis of colorectal cancer. So these are the references. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, for the presentation. Any questions uh, from the audience? Yeah, I would like to ask a question. You know, you said the diagnostic sensitivity of CAE is only 40%. And uh, so in that context, actually, what is what is the use of CAE at all? Because you are saying it cannot be used to prognosticate. So what is the place of CAE in this condition? You know, what is the use at all? Yes, so CAE is like, commonly used to diagnose colorectal cancers, but in some patients, CEA levels are identified. So therefore, we are, our main study is trying to identify other potential markers. I mean, as of the, the data of the diagnostic sensitivity is that from global data, is it? Global yes, data on CEA is 40%. So I'm uh, Sachini here. Uh, I'm one of the co-authors and uh, the importance of carcinoembryonic antigen in colorectal cancer, that is the only tumor marker which has the predictive and prognostic uh, value where all the patients do not secrete carcinoembryonic antigen. So the whole purpose of this study is to find out is there any other markers that we could find out in our cohort of patients. Thank you. 
Uh, okay, I have a question. Uh, now uh, you uh, showed the uh, Sri Lanka data in uh, 2020, but in Sri Lanka still uh, the National Cancer Control Program have not uh, collected 2020 data. The complete uh, data results only available uh, up to 2011 and provisional results are there 2014 only. So how yes. can you... Yes. yes, sir. Those results were obtained from the World Health Organization. Which data? Sorry, which database? It was from global uh, base of the World Health Organization. You mean the global can? Yes, sir. We read data. Okay, then uh, another question now, uh, uh, as uh, person Ardhara Suri also mentioned. Uh, so uh, now you have looked at the correlations. Uh, but uh, what is the percentage of uh, patients in your cohort who had uh, CEA less than 5 nanograms? So all of the patients' CEA levels were above 5.5. Yeah, then I think your uh, study methodology is uh, not very good, no, because if you are going to find a biomarker for uh, CRC, you should get all CRC patients without, without elevated and then only uh, you will uh, be able to find a better indicator than CEA. Uh, so, sorry, I'm Sachini again. This study, the main purpose of this study is to find out a biomarker, but this group, subgroup analysis, what we are presenting to IRC here, we, we didn't come out with the conclusion of our main objective. What we are trying to present this to this forum is to show the uh, correlation between the biochemical um, value of CEA and the other parameters. That is only a subgroup analysis, sir. Any further questions? Okay, uh, shall we go to the next presentation then? Uh, then will uh, introduce the next speaker. Uh, the next presentation is explanatory models of cancer among Sri Lankans and interim analysis. Uh, the study will be presented by uh, P.H. Solomon. Over to you. Greetings of the day and welcome to my uh, presentation today. My presentation will be on explanatory models of cancer among Sri Lankans. Uh, this is an interim analysis of the study. Uh, as you know, cancer is a leading uh, death worldwide and the incidence of cancer is in the rise globally as well as in Sri Lanka uh, and there are higher rates of cancer in countries with middle and low developmental levels and uh, uh, in Sri Lanka one out of every 10 people has a lifetime risk of developing cancer. Uh, explanatory models if I introduce Health beliefs are supposed to play a major role in the etiology and all subsequent stages of any disease or illness. So explanatory models refer to the person's personal etiological framework, or in other words, how a person explains why he or she got some kind of illness or a disease. So um, this, these beliefs can be quite important among cancer patients uh, because uh, there are concerns related to treatment toxicity and treatment tolerance uh, may have a continued impact on the quality of life of cancer patients. So in Asian individuals, uh, it has been observed that there are two parallel sets of explanatory models. One is based on Western medical models, while the other is based on cultural and religious beliefs. So the current study attempts to explore how these EMs or explanatory models may correlate with the well-being of cancer patients. 
The study has obtained ethical approval from uh, KDUFOMERC and the current paper is based on the first phase of the study. So an explore, exploratory study was conducted to explore the nature of the EMs among a convenient sample of 142 adults. These uh, individuals were contacted via the principal investigators personal Google contacts and it was uh, conducted as an online survey uh, via a Google form uh, using a self-developed questionnaire. The questionnaire was uh, pre-tested and a phase validity of the questionnaire was conducted before using it for the study. So these are the sample characteristics. Um, all participants had access to the questionnaire in all three languages. The majority responded in English and the majority of the sample was female. And uh, if we look at the educational level, the majority of the sample had uh, postgraduate qualifications. 5% of the sample had a past or a current diagnosis of cancer and 20.7% had a first degree family member with a diagnosis of cancer and the mean age of the sample was 36. So uh, in the questionnaire we listed uh, explanatory models related to the western medical model as well as explanatory models related to religious and cultural beliefs. So the majority of the sample uh, believed uh, biological reasons to be the most important uh, biomedical explanation of uh, cancer or in other words most people believed biological reasons were important in the etiology of cancer. If you look at the um, religious and cultural explanations that people believed the strongest belief was on karma. The majority of the sample believed karma was the most important thing uh, that was related to developing a cancer. And the second most uh, believed uh, explanatory model was uh, destiny and the third was God's will. As you can see beliefs on evil spirits, evil eye and witchcraft and charms are very less uh, among the sample. Uh, as we see karma as a very strong uh, belief that is held by many, um, it, it would be important to discuss the connection between locus of control and karma. Locus of control refers to whether the person believes that um, uh, he or she is responsible in some a part to the development of the disease and whether the person believes that they can do something about improving their health status. People with internal locus of control believes that they have to take responsibility for their health status and they can do something about uh, changing the current health status. People with external locus of control actually believe that something else such as your stars, your destiny or your family members are responsible for your status of health and usually are not very uh, much willing to take responsibility to improve the situation. So uh, what we have realized uh, during this research is some people interpret karma as a changeable force, whereas some interpret it as a predefined unchangeable force. So uh, we will have to find out how people interpret the concept of karma actually to see uh, how uh, this strongly held belief about karma in regards to cancer would affect uh, treatment adherence, uh, subsequent prognosis and their well-being. So we hope to con conduct uh, that part of the research very soon. So in conclusion, uh, uh, the study indicates uh, biological explanatory models are uh, very much believed by uh, the individuals and the most strongly believed religious cultural reason for cancer is to be karma 
and when we further inquired about the treatment method they would choose most stated that they would choose uh, treatments related to the western medical model as well as treatments based on religious and cultural methods but when we asked them as to what is the most important treatment method uh, the majority thought the western medical treatment were to be the most important treatment for cancer so uh, it would be important for clinicians to remember that uh, most of the cancer patients would like to uh, probably integrate alternative treatments to the mainstay of the western medical treatments and uh, most of them will hold strong beliefs in concepts such as karma in explaining their condition and the limitations of the study uh, are uh, the salience of these uh, explanatory models can be different in individuals who are uh, receiving treatment for cancer at present. Uh, so at present we have completed collecting data from patients who are currently receiving treatment uh, from the oncology department of the UHKDU. We are yet to analyze the data and um, these are my references. Uh, so I think it's time for questions and uh, answers. Thank you very much, Ms. Alaman. So now the paper is open for discussion. Yeah, I'll start again. Uh, thank you, Tina, for that extremely lucid uh, presentation. But uh, don't you think your sample is a, uh, you said it's a convenient sample, but isn't it a highly biased, very elite, and sophisticated sample, completely unrepresentative of the majority of cancer patients in Sri Lanka. Uh, yes, sir. as it's a convenient sample and chosen from my personal contacts, it's biased. Even the age is close to most uh, the, of the sample members are close to my age. Uh, so uh, in the subsequent- If I forget that DHD is postgraduate qualification. <laughs> Yes, uh, so in the subsequent stages, we hope to actually uh, recruit a more representative samples. Uh, this is just the first phase. In the like main phase of the study, we would uh, recruit a representative sample. What was the sampling method, uh, Dina? Uh, we uh, actually used a convenient sample uh, with a very uh, selective sampling method uh, using uh, my own contacts actually, the Google contacts. I don't know how I escaped from being in the sample. <laughs> Uh, actually, sir, we um, uh, I uh, uh, actually recruited the first 500 contacts from the Google contact list. So, um, uh, as a way of at least minimizing some bias, so uh, I only used the first uh, 500 contacts that I had. All the patients were diagnosed with cancer. Uh, these are not uh, patients, sir. Uh, uh, only a very few people of the sample had a current or past diagnosis of cancer. Uh, data is being collected from uh, cancer patients at present. Uh, so this is just the first phase of the study. We just wanted to see uh, what were the common beliefs in people. So uh, it's uh, I, I accept the fact that it's not at all representative. It's just an exploratory study to see what sort of beliefs are there. Any further question? Uh, can I can I uh, ask a question? I'm Professor Arena. Yes, sir. Now you know that uh, uh, the concept of karma among uh -huh. the ordinary public, if, if if there is something unknown to them, the cause is not known. They will say it's karma. But yes. karma has a different meaning. So you have to be very careful because it has two meanings which is in usage. One is the cause is not known. Other one is they are in religion there is a thing called karma. You have to be very particular about what karma they are referring to. 
yes uh, uh, when we did few informal interviews we realized that something karma can be changed and some people think it cannot be changed so uh, we will have to see how they interpret karma to actually decide yeah, its effect the, the, the real meaning of karma we should have a very clear idea yes thank you thank you not 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 only karma so the other things also because uh, which craft means what kind of which craft is it already thing or any any other things everything i think we need to have a clear cut off thing that what the really meaning of that yes so yes, yeah yes um, yeah yeah thank you very much tina it was a very interesting presentation uh, did you disaggregate your data according to the education levels and was there anything interesting which came out um so actually i did analyze whether there was any relationship between the type of uh, religious uh, uh, like explanatory models and their educational types there was no significant relationships i right. didn't uh, include it in the study but uh, i did analyze that part i uh, i was also interested in it but there was no relationship between the level of education and the type of belief set thanks any more questions i mean uh, would you say that the real significant finding from your study is that even in this very elite sophisticated group a substantial number believed in some kind of alternative therapy as complementary to normal therapy Is i that- think i think so sir because uh, as you can see most of them are graduates but uh, most of the people explained uh, they are uh, you know uh, cancer as uh, a karmic disease and the other thing is most of the people uh, have said that they would like to incorporate uh, other uh, treatment methods but they accept that the most important treatment method is the western medical treatment are you hoping to do some qualitative studies zatina uh few sir i'm hoping to conduct few uh, focus group discussions after this uh, among uh, patients who are receiving treatments at present and uh, but the main study is mostly quantitative where i would uh, quantify the measures of well being and the uh, types of beliefs and their relationship because if you really want to get good information about uh, their models and how the ex- the status of the locus and things like that you'll have to do uh, maybe a f- uh, 7 or 8 or whatever you know until saturation is achieved some qualitative studies because that's the way you will understand what is happening your yes. quantitative studies are not going to answer that yeah exactly right. yes so thank you sir thank you for and, the and suggestion. you you should confine the sample to those who have had cancer uh yes so that is, that, that uh, stage of the study is uh, happening right now sir we haven't still analyzed the data uh we are collecting data from the patients now Okay, in the absence of any further questions, we will move on to the next presentation. Dr. Pramila Perera will introduce the speaker. Uh, the next speaker, uh, next presentation is early detection, safe flight, a diagnostic stage of primary presenting of breast cancer, time taken for the to seek treatment and factors associated with treatment delay in female patients in Apache Hospital and Apache Hospital KDU. and the paper will be presented by w a rashmi how are you yeah person panel of judges ladies and gentlemen a very good morning to you all i would like to thank the irc for giving me this opportunity to present our study i'm rashmi vijay sekra the principal author of this study titled early detection diagnosis stage at the time of clinical presentation of breast cancer time taken to seek treatment and factors associated with treatment delay in female breast cancer patients at apexha hospital and university hospital kotalavala defense university moving on to the introduction 
The most common cancer to be diagnosed in women is breast cancer, which accounts for 30% of all new cancer diagnoses worldwide. Death caused by breast cancer in Sri Lanka reached 1.07% of total deaths in 2019. Delay in presentation of breast cancer increases morbidity, mortality, and decreased survival rates of these patients. Breast cancers, if detected early, have a significantly better prognosis compared to most other types of cancer. And the key to detection is healthcare seeking behavior, which is mainly influenced by the identification of early signs and symptoms. Therefore, we look into this study. Our study aimed to assess the stage of diagnosis and health seeking behavior of female breast cancer patients attending oncology unit of University Hospital, Kotalawala Defense University, and Apeksha Hospital of Sri Lanka. Our specific objectives are as seen on the slide. Let me talk about the research methodology. We carried out a hospital based descriptive cross sectional study at two hospitals, namely University Hospital, Kotalawala Defense University, and Apeksha Hospital, Maharagama. Our study population was diagnosed female breast cancer patients between 30 to 85 years of age at the time of the study. Study sample was 121 female patients. A systematic sampling method was employed to collect survey participants. Participants were selected from the Apeksha Hospital's oncology clinic on every Tuesdays and Fridays and from oncology clinic of University Hospital KDU on every Tuesdays. Data collection was done using a pre-tested anonymous self-administered questionnaire. Questionnaire developed after referring to existing medical literature and with tailor-made questions. Level of knowledge about symptoms of breast cancer was analyzed by allocating 1.4 each correctly marked stem. Secondary data from literature review used to design knowledge checklist. Stage of diagnosis was made cross-verified by accessing the medical records of the responding women with their consent. Data were analyzed using SPSS version 26. Descriptive statistics were used to describe data through frequency tables and cross-tabulations. Hypotheses were developed and chi-square tests were used to accept or reject them using a statistical significance of less than 0.05 probability at a 95% confidence interval. Let me break down the sample further. The final sample consisted of 121 participants with the response rate of almost 100%. Majority of the respondents, that is 80.17% were from Western province. The mean age was 56.3 years. Level of education for most of the participants was up to all levels, that is 45.5%. These are some of the frequency data we have analyzed. Now I will share some of the findings of the study. The first result presented here shows how the stage of cancer at diagnosis advanced with delay in presenting with 100% of metastasized patients being significantly delayed in seeking treatment. Therefore, we see a significant association between time of presentation and stage at diagnosis. This research talks about the knowledge of women about the commonest non-symptom of breast cancer, that is breast lungs. Most participating women knew about the symptom. The results show that there is no significant association between knowledge of the commonest symptom of presentation and delay when seeking treatment. Result 3 shows that there is no significant relationship between the commonest symptom of presentation and delay of presentation when seeking treatment. If the patient had a relative with a positive history of carcinoma, they were much faster to seek treatment with 96% showing no delay in presenting. As shown in the table, there is a significant difference between the presentation times of women with a family history of carcinoma 
and the ones without a history. The graph shows the women's knowledge and attendance of the Wellwomen Clinic with only 7.5% of participating women attending the clinic at least once a year. Data was gathered to understand the factors that delay in presenting and the most significant factors are presented here. The analysis is from multiple answers. Ignorance of mild symptoms was the strongest delaying factor from the total sample of 121 women, that is 8.3%. Now I'm going to talk about our conclusions. The study revealed that 84.2% of respondents had presented to the healthcare facilities for treatment without a significant delay, which is a positive improvement when compared with previous studies done in the same geographical area. The study shows a significant association between the time they have taken to seek medical treatment and the advanced stage of cancer at the time of presentation. However, the study identified there are still areas that require improvements, such as knowledge and awareness on the symptoms, other than most common symptoms of breast carcinoma. The Well Women Clinic, which is a valuable system to uphold women's health, is being ignored by many women, mainly due to lack of awareness of its existence. Among all the factors considered throughout the study, it was found that technical factors such as ignorance of mild symptoms, as well as real life factors, including giving priority to household work and other responsibilities, hoping to seek other medication, having no one to accompany to seek treatment are significantly associated with the delayed presentation of patients for treatment. The study showed that factors such as uh, knowledge of the commonest symptom of presentation, embarrassment among patients in exposing breast to a medical practitioner, fear of losing a breast, fear of believing myths about cancer treatment, fear of partner abandonment, inconvenience in obtaining transport to the hospital, insufficient monthly income, distance to health facilities, and lack of family support are not significantly associated with the delay of presentation for treatment. Patients who have a positive family history on breast carcinoma are more liable to seek treatment and show an early presentation to the healthcare facilities. These are our limitations of the study. Most patients had difficulties reaching the hospitals during pandemic condition. Self-administration of questionnaire may have allowed for different interpretations or understanding of questions by participants. These are the recommendations which we have tried to group them for better implementation. Under this, establishment of effective public awareness programs about breast cancer thus addressing early detection through self-based examination and the need for seeking healthcare as early as possible. Increase the awareness of information about the benefits and the risk of potential treatments of breast cancer in hospital settings and avoid Breast cancer awareness campaigns, more accessible clinics, walk-in centers, and mobile health clinics should be organized. Emphasizing the importance of attending the clinic at NYH level. Educating and creating awareness not only among women, but also in the whole family and society, thus reducing social stigma and strengthening the support given by family. Expansion of healthcare facilities all over the country for diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer is essential. Establishment of mammography services, one-stop shops, and mobile health units within communities which are easily accessible, open later, and at the weekend. This will help to increase prognosis, survival rate, and improve quality of life among patients with breast cancer. And the last one is to continue the progress and effectiveness of these interventions. It can be assessed if follow-up monitoring and evaluation studies are conducted periodically, expanding to include other cancer-focused healthcare facilities. Thank you. Thank you so much for this.
Brave is open for discussion. Any questions? And uh, this is a very good uh, study, and uh, I'm very thankful to her for doing such a study. But uh, there is something I would like to add because supposing the the factors responsible for patients' delay is occurring in a particular locality, it's important to mention which part of the the whole region they are coming from. Then of course you can trace back because I also have done research mm -hmm. like that. So uh, remedial measures can be taken. For example, there can be a pocket where the patient in that living in that particular area due to some reason they are not going to the hospital. Then you can identify because if you say the Western province is a huge area, so that will benefit or uh, help the patients as well as the country. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Can okay. I ask whether, yeah, okay, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, answer the question and I'll ask. Uh, this leads to the assumption that the majority of participants uh, uh, from uh, Western province, uh, uh, that is 80.1%, uh, sir, and uh, because the condition of the Western province, uh, where the accessibility to uh, healthcare facilities and the awareness much higher uh, in Western province, uh, we would like to extend uh, our research uh, further uh, to uh, for a, a better, larger represent, representative sample, uh, which would uh, represent uh, social, which would uh, represent a socio economic uh, analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can I ask a question? Was the definition of delay in presentation counted from the first presentation to a primary care practitioner or from the presentation to the tertiary care clinic that you mentioned? Because I suspect that part of the delay is the delay between the first presentation to the primary care practitioner and the tertiary care. What was your definition? Significant delay uh, means uh, time uh, taken to seek uh, first medical help after uh, three months and uh, no significant delay means uh, time taken to seek uh, medical help before three months. Sir. So when you said medical help, if that gone to a GP even, you counted it as no yes, delay? Sir. Yes. All ah, right. Okay. No, not, not, those, not the time of presentation to Apeksha or KD? No. Sir. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Any further questions? Yeah, I have one question. I'm Dr. Himali from KDU Care. I better suggest to use uh, Fisher's extract test, uh, rather a uh, chi-square test, because uh, sample size is small. So you can get better significance. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay. So we go to the next uh, session. Uh, in the absence of any further questions, the uh, next one will be introduced to the speaker. Yeah. Uh, the, the next presentation is on microbial resistance in bacteria isolated. The sound has gone. Okay, the next next presentation is multidrug resistance in bacteria isolated from respiratory specimens of COVID-19 pneumonia patients admitted to a tertiary care hospital in Sri Lanka. The presenter is Dr. WMID Nakavita. Over to you, Dilly. Good morning. Our study was multidrug resistance in bacteria isolated from respiratory specimens of COVID-19 pneumonia patients admitted to a tertiary care hospital in Sri Lanka. Brief introduction about the topic. 
Drug resistant pathogens are serious public health concern. There is alarming rapid global spread of multidrug resistant bacteria make common infections untreatable with existing broad spectrum antibiotics. So this is the situation in, uh, in the world. So the deaths estimated by 2050. So in our part of the world, so it is estimated that 4.7 million deaths due to antimicrobial resistance. So this is the deaths uh, estimated in 2050 uh, globally due to different re reasons. So when considering the cancer, it is 8.2 million deaths while deaths due to antimicrobial resistance is 10 million. So what is the impact of COVID-19 on antimicrobial resistance? So there are a high number of patients with COVID-19 worldwide and admitted to hospital wards and ICUs. And there are a substantial proportion who receive preemptive broad spectrum antibiotics at the initial stage of their disease. So review of Chinese reports from January to April 2020 summarized that 72% of patients receive broad spectrum antibiotics despite the paucity of evidence for bacterial infections. And there are difficulties faced by healthcare workers to adhere to antibiotic stewardship policies and there are lapses in the infection prevention and control practices during this pandemic, which leads to cross infections and spread of multidrug resistant organisms. So justification of our study, so COVID-19 pneumonia patients are more prone to hospital acquired infections, out of which the ventilator associated pneumonia is very high and the rates vary uh, from 48 to 79% in different locations according to the available literature. So these patients are more vulnerable to multidrug resistant organisms as well due to early administration of broad spectrum antibiotics and lapses in the infection control precautions uh, in the during management of these patients. So considering the situation, we thought of conducting a preliminary surveillance study to describe the antibiotic sensitivity patterns of bacterial isolates from respiratory specimens of COVID-19 pneumonia patients at UHKDU ICUs and also to conduct training programs on improving the infection control practices uh, in the healthcare staff. So this study was conducted as retrospective cross-sectional study and the respiratory specimens received to microbiology laboratory at UHKDU from COVID-19 pneumonia patients with suspected pneumonia uh, in intensive care units from 27 January 2021 to 31st May 2021 were included. This is 27th of January was the date that we have started our COVID ICU. And these specimens were graded according to the Murray Washington classification depending on the microscopy results. And only good quality samples were included for the study. So, Basic demographic data of the patients were obtained from laboratory test forms by culture results and AVST results were taken from laboratory worksheets. Anonymized data were analyzed using MS Excel. And the ethics clearance for the study was obtained from the ethics review committee, KDU. Results, respiratory specimens, 73 respiratory specimens were obtained from 50 COVID-19 patients were included. So these patients were suspected secondary bacterial pneumonia patients. So mean age of the patient was 57, while majority 62% were males. And this is the, uh, the figure one shows the uh, different types of specimens that we received. 56% were endotracheal secretions, 41% sputum samples, and 3% were bronchial lavage specimens. And out of the 73 specimens, 47 had significant growth, that is 64% of specimens. And out of which 64 bacterial and fungal isolates were grown. So the out of the organisms grown, majority were Acinetobacter, that is 42%. And then 22% were Enterobacteria coliform group, which consists of many bacterial gram-negative bacterial genera. And 16% were Pseudomonas group. And 17% candida, while 3% were MRSA isolates. 
So this is the antibiotic sensitivity pattern of the Acinetobacter species uh, in our uh, population. Uh, so according to these results, so this red indicates the resistance. Uh, so you can see Acinetobacter yes, isolates are 100% resistant to keftazidine, kefipine, piperacidine, tazobacter, merapenem, and imipenem. And also there is high level of resistance to uh, piperacidine, uh, to, to ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, and all the aminoglycosides. Only uh, few isolates were sensitive to cotrimoxazole and uh, kefaperazone salvector, where the cholestine sensitivity was 100%, making cholestine the only hope to treat acinetobacter infections among these patients. So when considering the antibiotic sensitivity pattern of the coliform, so, so it is also a similar pattern. Uh, so most of the antibiotics, the commonly used antibiotic, formoxiclav is almost resistant, and third generation kefalosporins, fourth generation kefalosporins, is almost resistant and uh, the aminoglycoside resistance is almost 50% and the piperacillin, ciprofloxin and leofloxin resistance is very low and uh, it meropenem resistant to 50% while imipenem resistant was 40% and polystein remains 100% sensitive again. So this is this FBSC pattern of the pseudomonas isolate uh, which is better when comparing to the acinetobacter and the uh, coliform group. Uh, so 50% of the isolates are sensitive to keftazidine and more than 50% sensitivity to kefipine, piperacillin, tazobactam, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, and aminoglycosides were seen. And there are 80% resistant to meropenem and uh, about 70% resistant to uh, imipenem, while polystene sensitivity is 100%. So this is the uh, uh, summary of the antibiotic resistant among gram negative isolates. So, multi drug resistant, when we consider the multi drug resistant, that is resistant to three or more antibiotic groups. So, Acinetobacter, 100% of the isolates are multi drug resistant, 92.8% of the coliform group is multi drug resistant, and 50% of the Pseudomonas species are multi drug resistant. If we consider the resistant to third generation kephalosporin, that is kephotaxin, keftriaxone, and keftazidine, so these two groups are 100% uh, resistant, while 40% resistant in pseudomonas. And carbapenem, meropenem, imipenem, so resistance is 100% in acinetobacter and 50% in coliform and 30% in, uh, in pseudomonas species. So in conclusion, multidrug resistant gram-negative bacteria is highly prevalent in the respiratory samples of COVID-19, critically ill uh, pneumonia patients at UHKDU, the commonest organism isolate was Acinetobacter species and all isolates were multidrug resistant. Resistant to third generation kephalosporins was almost 100% in Acinetobacter and coliform groups, while carbapenem resistance was alarming. Common source transmission of Acinetobacter species within the ICU is also a possibility when comparing the antibiotic sensitivity patterns. So these are the limitations of our study. So organisms isolated from patients may be colonizers as well as we couldn't correlate the culture results with the clinical criteria for ventilator associated pneumonia. And there were no facilities available to identify them up to the species level. So these were the interventions that we have done, short training sessions on infection control conducted for new nurses allocated to ICUs on roster basis by the infection control team. And in-charge nurses were trained on disinfection and sterilization of patient care equipment and environment. And uh, these are the future ongoing studies, continuous antimicrobial resistance surveillance in COVID-19 and COVID non-COVID-19 units and assess the impact of multidrug resistance on disease progression and outcome of COVID-19 patients with secondary bacterial pneumonia in our intensive care units. So I would like to thank Dr. Varuna Navaratna and Dr. Nasmiya Mubarak, consultant microbiologist, and all the medical laboratory technicians at the microbiology laboratory who works tirelessly during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nakavita, for that very informative presentation. Now the paper is open for discussion.
Yes, uh, I have a question. Now, uh, what is the percentage of uh, over 60 in your sample? Yes, sir. Uh, what was the percentage of over 60 in your sample? Uh, that is, uh, uh, it's around 70% uh, of the patients were uh, over 60. Yeah, uh, now. Uh, uh, so actually that was the early stage of the uh, this ICU setting. So now, uh, now actually it's coming down. The more young patients are getting admitted nowadays. Uh, then uh, uh, was this uh, antibiotic resistance seen more? among the immunocompromised people? Uh, that part, sir, we have not uh, I not done so that the clinical correlation was not uh, assessed. So this is only the laboratory-based surveillance that we have done. So in our future studies that we are going to uh, assess those things as well. Thank you. Now, uh... hey. Yes, yeah. I have one question. So uh, during, uh, now you have presented the antibiotic resistant pattern among the patients who have been admitted to ICU. So most likely these patients being treated in the wards prior to, uh, prior to getting admitted to the ICU. So yeah. have you looked at what were the antibiotics given uh, before they were admitted to the ICU? Uh, not actually. So this is totally a laboratory based uh, surveillance to Mita, so we have not uh, got this information, the previous antibiotics. So that uh, with that data, we are going to uh, do uh, in future uh, study uh, to, 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 uh, to see the impact of the uh, antibiotics uh, on admission to the ICU and also the other risk factors which are affecting uh, this multidrug resistance and also the impact of multidrug resistance on the outcome of these patients. Uh, as an addition to that Dumita's question, I think uh, in addition to ciprofloxacin and coamoxiclav, I think the drugs given orally include doxycycline and uh, acetromycin. So you could uh, include that those in your list when you are looking for resistance. But those are some of the drugs which are given orally before they get into the critical phase. Uh, uh, no, sir. This COVID patients, usually the, the problem with the COVID patients is most of the time these patients are started on broad spectrum antibiotic at the very initial stage. So they, they are not started on oral antibiotics. Uh, so no, you, no the, I'm talking about the ones before they get into ICU. ICU. They are on oral, yeah. Yeah, so even the ward setups, uh, so most of the time they should they are started on uh, at least uh, keftriaxone or kefotaxime or most of the time uh, piperacillin tazobacter. Uh, the oral antibiotics, uh, so that actually we need to do audit and see. Uh, so uh, uh, the prescription patterns uh, of these patients. Now in the light of what you have found, uh, don't you think, can, can you hear me? Yes, sir. And in the light of what you have presented, don't you think that uh, sort of formulating a very rigid antibiotic policy to prevent this occurrence of, uh, you know, this resistant coming up or resistant strains and also identification of carriers among the staff, don't you think is an important step? Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, yes, that is also very important, sir. Uh, so uh, to identify the carriers, but the thing is, the, the most of the time, this uh, uh, certain few organisms are only uh, uh, responsible for this carrier stage. So when we consider the healthcare workers, because the thing is now, this most of these uh, hospital acquired pneumonias of COVID nineteen patients are from gram negative uh, uh, organisms. So these gram negative. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more questions? In the absence of any other question, any questions, uh, we will move on to the next presentation. Dr. Anga Pereira will introduce this next presenter. Yes, the next uh, paper to be discussed is evaluating bioinfluence of two formulation of calcium immediate release from field water tablets in the Ministry of Health. Tablets in the health uh, Sri Lankan subjects under fasting condition and to be presented by US plus Acre.
what you were Good morning, everybody. I am Peksha Sevan Kulasekara, Temporary Demonstrator, Faculty of Medicine, KDU. Today I present here to present by frequent study that was carried out as per the request made by the State Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Corporation of Sri Lanka to KDU, KEA, to conduct by equals studies for their product. The title of this presentation is Evaluation by Equals of Dupomycin of Lerithromycin Immediate Release Being Coated Tablets in Healthy Sri Lankan Subjects Under Fasting Conditions. These are the content of this presentation. When moving to the introduction, I would like to give a brief introduction regarding bioequivalent study. When the parent drug, patent of the parent drug is over, parent competitor pharmaceutical companies are free to formulate their own version of innovative product. Such products are referred to as generic or branded generic product and also it can be cheaper than parent drug. According to WHO and regulatory authority mandates to confirm therapeutic interchangeability of generic products to parent drug. In this study was evaluated the equivalence of erythromycin 250 mg immediate release generic stephanospital manufacturing corporation oral tablets. Clarithromycin was classified as biopharmaceutic classification system class 2 and therefore it needs bioequivalence a study. Clarithromycin is a semi-synthetic microlite derived from erythromycin A and it is a broad spectrum antibacterial agent. It gives better pharmacokinetic properties and longer half-life as compared to the erythromycin. Aim of this study is to compare the relative bioavailability of clarithromycin to tablets of 250 mg generic SPMC with clarithid 500 mg tablets innovated about India in healthy Sri Lankan adult subjects under fasting condition. A study design was a Randomized to treatment to period to sequence open label single dose crossover trial under fasting condition with one week washout period. Ethical approval was taken from KDU Ethics Bureau Committee. These are the exclusion and inclusion criteria of this study. When moving to the methodology, this is the procedure to recruitment of healthy volunteers. Volunteers were informed about the study and their consent were obtained. Then following tests were conducted to be see the volunteers are medically suitable to this study. Then collection of the blood sample volunteers were kept for 12 hours fasting, fasting condition after given the drug administration and then blood samples were collected as the mentioned in six in this diagram we collected 16 blood samples from each volunteer over 24 hour of dosing drug administration this this was the randomized crossover trial and one week or short period. Method of analysis was done by high performance liquid chromography and it UV spectrometric methods to evaluate the concentration of electromycin in, in the plasma. C18 analytical column was used and as Mobile phase, the measure of acid nitrate, 
dihydrogen potassium phosphate methanol at the temperature of 3 to 1 to 1. Olive the volume pressure. Prosipomycin was used as the internal stack. Extraction was optimized choosing ethyl acetate hexane 1 to 1 in alkaline condition. Validation of analytical method was followed by ICH guideline. According to that accuracy, linearity range, limit of detection, limit of quantification and precision was determined. And also absolute recovery, prenatal recovery from quality control samples with five trials. And also specificity, matrix effect and matrix control was classified in this study. Then move into the phrases and discussion. These are the kind of um, plasma concentration time curve for each individual were established. You can see some examples of graphs for four individuals. Following pharmacokinetic parameters statistically analyzed and area under concentration time curves. The elimination rate constant, the elimination half-life, the maximum plasma capacity uh, concentration was uh, analyzed using this uh, statistical software. In the pharmacokinetic parameters of the bioequals study, we analyzed uh, reference with the Test product according to the mean value of this study, the rate of absorption were not significantly different. The above results demonstrate at the plasma concentration time profile of clarithromycin generic SPMC formulation and the reference product clarithromycin has comparable. For, uh, pharmaceutical parameters with regarding the extent of absorption uh, area under curve 0 to t time and 0 to infinity time. When moving to the this 90% uh, confident intervals of the uh, Cmax and area under curve 0 to infinity level of clarithromycin after 500 mg signal single administration of reference and test formulation in 12 healthy volunteers. According to this result, no statistically significant differences were found between the formulation for the time to reach CMAX and elimination of half-life values. The pharmacokinetic and bioequal values were obtained with the test and preference formulation in the acceptable range of the 80 to 125 percent. Here you can see T max and T half values of this study. At the conclusion, the test product recommends me generic SPMC two tablets of 250 milligram was by equivalent to the Reference product clarity 500 mg. The two formulations are bioequivalent and can be used interchangeably in clinical practice. They are for in negligible adverse events and subject tolerated both formulation equally well. These are the reference in, in this study and also. We would like to express our deep gratitude to the director and administrative staff of University Hospital KDU for logistical support and all volunteers who participate in this study, nursing officers, especially medical board, 
and other supportive staff of University Hospital KDU and BNL1 of the Faculty of Medicine KDU for their valuable contribution for this present study. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the paper is open for discussion. Any questions from the audience? Okay, in the absence of any questions, we move on to the next presentation, which is the last presentation of this session. Uh, the presentation is on prevalence of staphylococcus and candida species in the oral cavities of the patients with cleft lip and cleft palate prior to reconstructive surgery. The presenter is Ms. H.K. Weatherly. Over to you. Good day, everybody. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to present my study on the topic prevalence of staphylococci and candida species in the oral cavities of the patient with cleft lip and palate prior to reconstructive surgery. Mm -hmm. Myself, Hansini Vedage, I'm a graduate in medical laboratory science, University of Peradeniya. And my supervisors are Professor J.M.S. Jayatilaka, Dr. Parakrama Vijaya Khan from Faculty of Dental Sciences, University of Peradini. CLP or the cleft lip and palate deformity commonly occurring due to the incomplete tissue formation during the fetal development. This results in splits in the upper lip palate or both upper lip and the palate. According to the prospective studies done in Sri Lanka, the incidence of CLP in Kandy district was found as 1 in 1000 births. This condition can be corrected with a reconstructive surgery planned during early childhood. The changes in the oral ecosystem due to CLP condition and due to surgical sites in oral mucosa may alter the oral microbial flora leading to opportunistic infections. Such common oral pathogens are staphylococci and candida species. Therefore, our study uh, main aim was to assess the prevalence of staphylococci and candida species in uh, these patients and to assess the prevalence of resistant organisms like MRSA and to determine the association between the demographic data and the microbiological profile. Our study population was the patients attending CRP clinic uh, for their first reconstructive surgery and with no other systemic disorders. We excluded some criteria like patients who have undergone recent antibiotic treatments, patients with other oral pathological conditions and other appliance therapy. For the sample and data collection, first the ethical uh, clearance was obtained from the Ethical Review Committee of Allied Health Science, University of Peradeniya. Then the informed written assent in their native languages was obtained from the legal guardians or the parents. Then the demographic data was collected by a interviewer administered questionnaire. The sample uh, collection was done in the oral and maxifacial surgery department, a dental hospital, Peradeniya. The swab collection from the oral mucosa of the site of the lesion was done by the attending consultant. Uh, the collected swabs were done for the microbiological investigation in a uh, dental faculty, University of Peradeniya. For the bacterial isolation, I cultured on both a black dega and maconchiega after the incubation uh, growth and the colony morphology was observed. 
for the suspect colonial subculturing and theoretical cultures was done and gram stain was performed. For the gram positive profile presented in clusters, catalase test was performed. Catalase uh, for the catalase positive results, slide coagulase, tube coagulase, and DNA test was performed uh, to differentiate staphylococcus and coagulase negative stuff. MRSA identification was done using the disk diffusion method with uh, 30 micrograms of oxygen in this. The uh, interpretation was done using the guidelines in CLSI M2 and M100 latest versions. Uh, the candida isolation was uh, done by the culturing on the sub, uh, subdrive destrose agar. Uh, when making this agar, I put antibiotics so there are they I didn't get any bacterial uh, growth in these uh, egg plates. For the yeast colonies, uh, look with colony morphology of green colored pasty colonies, uh, I performed gram stain. As you can see in the gram stain, we have uh, gram positive yeast cells and budding cells very nicely. And for these cultures, I performed germ tube test. And for the confirmation, another agar, brilliance candida agar was used uh, for the green color colonies with a germ tube test positive uh, was identified as candida albicans and pink purple colonies with negative germ tube test was identified as non-albicans. These are the final results of my uh, study the microbial profile total 52 samples were collected out of these uh, 52 34 were person uh, 34 were positive for staphylococci species 12 were positive for candida species with respective percentages of 65 percent and 23 percent other than these uh, two organisms. Um, there were some positive uh, other bacteria growth in uh, these uh, samples. Uh, commonly, they were oral, common oral flora such as Streptococci and Lactobacilli. Uh, the positive 34 samples of Staphylococci species, a majority of them were coagulous negative staph with 20 positive samples. And uh, the rest of the 14 samples were staphorous, but uh, in these 14 samples, eight were identified as methicillin resistant staphorous with significant percentage of 15.4%. In the candida isolates of 12, uh, the majority were candida albicans with seven positive samples. As you can see uh, in this microbial micro microbial profile, the significant uh, isolation was um, from Staphylococci species. <laughs> Staph has the majority of uh, positive samples. These are the demographic characteristic of uh, my study participants. They were age range from uh, four months to 18 months and most of them were around nine months to 10 months old. Uh, as I explained before, there are three types of cleft and uh, 26 were having cleft lip, uh, 14 were having clefts in the palate, 12 were having clefts in both lip and palate. When it's come to gender, 27 were males and 25 were females. Then I look for the association between the demography factors and the microbiological profile using SPSS software. Uh, for this, first the normality testing was done, then the chi-square test was performed. Uh, P-values less than 0.05% were considered as significant. As you can see, all the P-values are uh, more than 0.05%. Therefore, no significant association was uh, 
observed during uh, between the demographic factors and the microbiological profile. To conclude, nearly 23% and 65% of the CLB patient in our sample had oral candida and staphs uh, re respectively. Larger proportion of oral staph are coagulase negative staph. Nearly 15% of oral staph aureus were MRSA. Candida albicans is, is the commonest candida species found in CLP patients. Demographic features were not significantly associated with the uh, prevalence of microorganisms. We recommend to perform a preoperative assessment of oral microorganisms with antimicrobial my resistance and to improve the oral hygiene of these patients. Finally, I would like to thank my patients and their parents and uh, all the technical staff who supported me. At the end, uh, I would like to say CLP is a uh, deformity that can be corrected with a simple surgical procedure, but these get complicated due to infections. Uh, therefore, a simple step forward can make uh, a beautiful difference for these innocent life. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Ms. Vedade, for that very informative presentation. Now the paper is open for discussion. Can I ask a question? Uh, uh, so what is the significance of uh, isolating stuff and candida from the oral cavity? So why did you select uh, these two organisms specifically? Is there any reason to select stuff and candida only? Uh, Madam, according to the literature review that I have done, uh, most of the uh, research findings uh, have the significant uh, prevalence in these uh, organisms. And uh, with the resources I uh, had and the time uh, allocated uh, with the time uh, I had, I uh, selected these two organisms because uh, they were uh, considered as the most uh, common oral pathogens. And the thing is, uh... Uh, so uh, this coagulase negative step, so most of your isolates are coagulase negative step and also candida species, they are part of the normal flora in the oral cavity. So yes. if you check in a healthy population also, you will get these two types of organisms. But MRSA of course is of significance, but the other two, mainly the candida is part of the normal flora. Uh, so, uh, if you could uh, actually uh, at least compare with a healthy, uh, healthy babies, uh, and uh, so you could have uh, seen some uh, difference in the uh, the population, or else so you could have uh, seen for other pathogens like a beta hemolytic streptococcus. Sometimes maybe significant, not maybe it's significant. Actually, it's a significant pathogen if you isolate, so it, which can cause severe infections uh, following the surgery. Yes, Madam, actually I uh, look for three organisms. Uh, I included beta hemolytic streptococci also, but uh, unfortunately for three uh, uh, samples, uh, the isolates were destroyed because uh, during this pandemic, the lab was closed, so I couldn't include that to my research. Uh, otherwise, I included beta hemolytic streptococci, uh, but uh, we are planning on uh, doing a, a, a further study with a normal population and we, we also looking forward to include post-surgical infection uh, findings also. Uh, were there any adverse clinical outcomes in any of these patients related to these organisms? Uh, that's uh, we did only uh, we were only able to assess the pre-surgical uh, information, sir. Uh, 
uh, we didn't have to in, uh, we were not able to include the post surgical informations but uh, now uh, we are collecting those informations and looking forward to include that informations because th those uh, patients are attending uh, for the post surgical clinics so we can collect those results um, okay thank you that's good thank you sir I have a basic question, small question. Can a uh, gram straining procedure you be used for the yeast? Uh, no, uh, it, it is not a confirmatory test, madam, uh, uh, but uh, I uh, perform that also. Yeah, because if we can do, that's an interesting issue. And I suggest that I agree with Dr. Dilini's comment and I think better use uh, healthy yeah, subjects also for a comparison. Thank you. Thank you. Now this uh, oral flora, 15% MRSC. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. And uh, that's an abnormal figure. So what were the remedial measures? Now these people were getting ready to go through a surgical procedure. Because your statistics say 15% of them had MRSC positive. What, what were the remedial measures? Uh, in, uh, I did this uh, research in the dental hospital, Peyradenia. Actually, in these patients, they are not performing a pre-microbiological uh, investigations before the surgery. They are not even um, investigating for MRSC kind of, uh, like a resistance bacteria. Uh, so that was the aim of my study to uh, uh, give them an idea that it is very important okay. to uh, do a pre uh, surgical investigation. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Yeah, if there are no questions, we will come to the conclusion of this uh, session. Uh, today, in the second session of the KDU IRC 2021, we have uh, discussed six papers one on uh, carcinoma embryonic and levels with colorectal carcinoma clinical features and explicitly models of uh, cancer among Sri Lankan uh, people, and an detection of breast carcinoma, time and delay representation. And another one on uh, multidrug resistant bacteria on polyp patient and bioequivalence of erythromycin to uh, bioequivalent levels and prevalence of staphylococcus and candida species on oral cavity patients with uh, Then Thank the judges and all the participants and all the presenters on behalf of the organizing committee of the ADIRC. And, uh, we wish you will join us in other sessions also after the lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have come to the end of the second technical session, which was indeed very interesting. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank Surgeon Captain Dr. Ranga Pereira and Dr. Dumita Govindapala for chairing this interactive session and the eminent judges, Professor Sar Saroj Jayasinghe and Professor Aindra Balasurya. With this, we conclude the second technical session of the 14th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotlavala Defense University we will now break for lunch. Join us for the next session starting at 1.30 in the afternoon. In the meanwhile, we hope you enjoy this video 
about the University Hospital, KDU.